Section 11 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Poetic Principle by Edgar Allan Poe. In speaking of the poetic principle, I have no design to be either thorough or profound. While discussing, very much at random, the essentiality of what we call poetry, my principal purpose will be to cite for consideration some few of those minor English or American poems which best suit my own taste, or which, upon my own fancy, have left the most definite impression. By minor poems I mean, of course, poems of little length. And here, in the beginning, permit me to say a few words in regard to a somewhat peculiar principle which, whether rightfully or wrongfully, has always had its influence in my own critical estimate of the poem. I hold that a long poem does not exist. I maintain that phrase, a long poem, is simply a flat contradiction in terms. I need scarcely observe that a poem deserves its title only inasmuch as it excites by elevating the soul. The value of the poem is in the ratio of this elevating excitement. But all excitements are, through a cycle necessity, transient. That degree of excitement which would entitle a poem to be so called at all cannot be sustained throughout a composition of any great length. After the lapse of half an hour at the very utmost, it flags, fails, a revulsion ensues, and then the poem is, in effect, and, in fact, no longer such. There are, no doubt, many who have found difficulty in reconciling the critical dictum that the paradise loss is to be devoutly admired throughout, with the absolute impossibility of maintaining for it, during perusal, the amount of enthusiasm which that critical dictum would demand. This great work, in fact, is to be regarded as poetical only when, losing sight of that vital requisite, in all works of art, unity, we view it merely as a series of minor poems. If to preserve its unity, its totality of effect or impression, we read it, as would be necessary, at a single sitting, the result is but a constant alternation of excitement and depression. After a passage of what we feel to be true poetry, there follows inevitably a passage of platitude which no critical prejudgment can force us to admire. But if, upon completing the work, we read it again, omitting the first book, that is to say, commencing with the second, we shall be surprised at now finding that admirable which we before condemned, that damnable which we had previously so much admired. It follows from all this that the ultimate aggregate or absolute effect of even the best epic under the sun is nullity, and this is precisely the fact. In regard to the Iliad, we have, if not positive proof, at least very good reason for believing it intended as a series of lyrics. But granting the epic intention, I can say only that the work is based on an imperfect sense of art. The modern epic is of the supposititious ancient model, but an inconsiderate and blindfold imitation. But the day of these artistic anomalies is over. If, at any time, any very long poem were popular in reality, which I doubt, it is at least clear that no very long poem will ever be popular again. That the extent of a poetical work is ceteris paribus, the measure of its merit, seems undoubtedly, when we thus state it, a proposition sufficiently absurd, yet we are indebted for it to the quarterly reviews. Surely there can be nothing in mere size, abstractly considered, there can be nothing in mere bulk, so far as volume is concerned, which has so continuously elicited admiration from these saturnine pamphlets. A mountain, to be sure, by the mere sentiment of physical magnitude which it conveys, does impress us with a sense of the sublime, but no man is impressed after this fashion by the material grandeur of even the Columbiad. Even the Quarterlies have not instructed us to be so impressed by it. As yet, they have not insisted on our estimating Lamartine by the cubic foot, or Pollock by the pound, 
but what else are we to infer from their continuing prating about sustained effort if by sustained effort any little gentleman has accomplished an epic let us frankly commend him for the effort if this is indeed a thing commendable but let us forbear praising the epic on the effort's account it is to be hoped that common sense in the time to come will prefer deciding upon a work of art rather by the impression it makes by the effect it produces than by the time it took to impress the effect or the amount of sustained effort which had been found necessary in effecting the impression the fact is that perseverance is one thing and genius quite another nor can all the quarterlies in christendom confound them by and by this proposition with many which i have just been urging will be received as self-evident in the meantime by being generally condemned as falsities they will not be essentially damaged as truths on the other hand it is clear that a poem may be improperly brief undue brevity degenerates into mere epigrammatism a very short poem while now and then producing a brilliant or vivid never produces a profound or enduring effect there must be the steady pressing down of the stamp upon the wax beranger has wrought innumerable things pungent and spirit-stirring but in general they have been too imponderous to stamp themselves deeply into the public attention and thus as so many feathers of fancy have been blown aloft only to be whistled down in the wind a remarkable instance of the effect of undue brevity in depressing poem in keeping it out of the popular view is afforded by the following exquisite little serenade i arise from the dream of thee in the first sweet sleep of night when the winds are breathing low and the stars are shining bright i arise from dreams of thee and a spirit in my feet has led me who knows how to thy chamber window sweet the wandering airs they faint on the dark the silent stream the champak odors fail like sweet thoughts in a dream the nightingale's complaint it dies upon the heart as i must die on thine o beloved as thou art o lift me from the grass i die i faint i fail let thy love in kisses rain on my lips and eyelids pale my cheek is cold and white alas my heart beats loud and fast o press it close to thine again where it will break at last very few perhaps are familiar with these lines yet no less a poet than shelley is their author their warm yet delicate and ethereal imagination will be appreciated by all and by none so thoroughly as by him who has himself arisen from sweet dreams of one beloved to bathe in the aromatic air of a southern midsummer night one of the finest poems by willis the very best in my opinion which he has ever written has no doubt through this same defect of undue brevity been kept back from its proper position not less in the critical than in the popular view the shadows lay along broadway twas near the twilight tide as slowly there a lady fair was walking in her pride alone walked she but viewlessly walked spirits at her side peace charmed the street beneath her feet and honor charmed the air and all astir looked kind on her and called her good as fair for all god ever gave to her she kept with cherry care she kept with care her beauties rare from lovers warm and true for heart was cold to all but gold and the rich came not to woo but honored well her charms to sell if priests the selling do now walking there was one more fair a slight girl lily pale and she had unseen company to make the spirit quail twixt want and scorn she walked forlorn and nothing could avail no mercy now can clear her brow for this world's peace to pray for as love's wild prayer dissolved in air her woman's heart gave way but the sin forgiven by christ in heaven by man is cursed alway in this composition we find it difficult to recognize the willis who has written so many mere verses of society 
The lines are not only richly ideal, but full of energy, while they breathe an earnestness and evident sincerity of sentiment, for which we look in vain throughout all the other works of this author. While the epic mania, while the idea that to merit in poetry prolixity is indispensable, has for some years been gradually dying out of the public mind by mere dint of its own absurdity, we find it succeeded by a heresy too palpably false to be long tolerated, but one which in the brief period it has already endured may be said to have accomplished more in the corruption of our poetical literature than all its other enemies combine. I allude to the heresy of the didactic. It has been assumed tacitly and avowedly, directly and indirectly, that the ultimate object of all poetry is truth. Every poem, it is said, should inculcate a moral, and by this moral is the poetical merit of the work to be adjudged. We Americans especially have patronized this happy idea, and we Bostonians very especially have developed it in full. We have taken it into our heads that to write a poem simply for the poem's sake, and to acknowledge such to have been our design, would be to confess ourselves radically wanting in the true poetic dignity and force. But the simple fact is that we would but permit ourselves to look into our own souls, we should immediately there discover that under the sun there neither exists nor can exist any work more thoroughly dignified, more supremely noble than this very poem, this poem per se, this poem which is a poem and nothing more, this poem written solely for the poem's sake. With as deep a reverence for the true as ever inspired the bosom of man, I would nevertheless limit, in some measure, its modes of inculcation. I would limit to enforce them. I would not enfeeble them by dissipation. The demands of truth are severe. She has no sympathy with the myrtles. All that which is so indispensable in song is precisely all that which she has nothing whatever to do. But it is but making her a flaunting paradox to wreathe her in gems and flowers. In enforcing a truth we need severity rather than efflorescence of language. We must be simple, precise, terse. We must be cool, calm, unimpassioned. In a word, we must be in that mood which, as nearly as possible, is the exact converse of the poetical. He must be blind indeed who does not perceive the radical and chasmal difference between the truthful and the poetical modes of inculcation. He must be theory-mad, beyond redemption, who in spite of these differences shall still persist in attempting to reconcile the obstinate oils and waters of poetry and truth. Dividing the world of mind into its three most immediately obvious distinctions, we have the pure intellect, taste, and the moral sense. I place taste in the middle because it is just this position which in the mind it occupies. It holds intimate relations with either extreme, but from a moral sense is separated by so faint a difference that Aristotle has not hesitated to place some of its operations among the virtues themselves. Nevertheless, we find the offices of the trio marked with a sufficient distinction. Just as the intellect concerns itself with truth, so taste informs us of the beautiful, while the moral sense is regardful of duty. Of this latter, while conscience teaches the obligation, and reason the expediency, taste contents herself with displaying the charms, waging war upon vice solely on the ground of her deformity, her disproportion, her animosity to the fitting, to the appropriate, to the harmonious, in a word, to beauty. An immortal instinct deep within the spirit of man is thus plainly a sense of the beautiful, this it is which administers to his delight in the manifold forms and sounds and odors and sentiments amid which he exists. And just as the lily is repeated in the lake, or the eyes of the amaryllis in the mirror, so is the mere oral or written repetition of these forms and sounds and colors and odors and sentiments a duplicate source of the light. 
but this mere repetition is not poetry he who shall simply sing with however glowing enthusiasm or with however vivid a truth of description of the sights and sounds and odors and colors and sentiments which greet him in common with all mankind he i say has yet failed to prove his divine title there is still something in the distance which he has been unable to attain we have still a thirst unquenchable to allay which he has not shown us the crystal springs this thirst belongs to the immortality of man it is at once a consequence and an indication of his perennial existence it is the desire of the moth for the star it is no mere appreciation of the beauty before us but a wild effort to reach the beauty above inspired by an ecstatic prescience to the glories beyond the grave we struggle by multiform combinations among the things and thoughts of time to attain a portion of that loveliness whose very elements perhaps appertain to eternity alone and thus when by poetry or when by music the most entrancing of the poetic moods we find ourselves melted into tears we weep then not as the abate gravina supposes through excess of pleasure but through a certain petulant impatient sorrow at our inability to grasp now wholly here on earth at once and forever those divine and rapturous joys which through the poem or through the music we attain to but brief and indeterminate glimpses the struggle to apprehend the supernal loveliness this struggle on the part of souls fittingly constituted has given to the world all that which it the world has ever been enabled at once to understand and to feel as poetic the poetic sentiment of course may develop itself in various modes in painting in sculpture in architecture in the dance very especially in music and very peculiarly with a wide field in the composition of the landscape garden our present theme however has regard only to its manifestation in words and here let me speak briefly on the topic of rhythm contenting myself with the certainty that music in its various modes of meter rhythm and rhyme is of so vast a moment in poetry as never to be wisely rejected is so vitally important an adjunct that he is simply silly who declines its assistance i will now pause to maintain its absolute essentiality it is in music perhaps that the soul most nearly attains the great end for which when inspired by the poetic sentiment it struggles the creation of supernal beauty it may be indeed that here this sublime end is now and then attained in fact we are often made to feel with a shivering delight that from an earthly harp are stricken notes which cannot have been unfamiliar to the angels and thus there can be little doubt that in the union of poetry with music in its popular sense we shall find the widest field for the poetic development the old bards and men and singers had advantages which we do not possess and thomas moore singing his own songs was in the most legitimate manner perfecting them as poems to recapitulate then i would define in brief the poetry of words as the rhythmical creation of beauty its sole arbiter is taste with the intellect or with the conscience it has only collateral relations unless incidentally it has no concern whatever with duty or with truth a few words however in explanation that pleasure which is at once the most pure the most elevating and the most intense is derived i maintain from the contemplation of the beautiful in the contemplation of beauty we alone find it possible to attain that pleasurable elevation or excitement of the soul which we recognize as the poetic sentiment and which is so easily distinguished from truth which is the satisfaction of the reason or from passion which is the excitement of the heart i make beauty therefore using the word as inclusive of the sublime i make beauty the province of the poem simply because it is an obvious rule of art 
that effects should be made to spring directly as possible from their causes no one as yet having been weak enough to deny that peculiar elevation in question is at least most readily obtainable in the poem it by no means follows however that the incitements of passion or the precepts of duty or even the lessons of truth may not be introduced into a poem and with advantage for they may subserve incidentally in various ways the general purposes of the work but the true artist will always contrive to tone them down in proper subjection to that beauty which is the atmosphere and the real essence of the poem i cannot better introduce the few poems which i shall present for your consideration than by the citation of the poem to longfellow's waif the day is done and the darkness falls from the wings of night as a feather is wafted downward from an eagle in his flight i see the lights of the village gleam through the rain and the mist and a feeling of sadness comes o'er me that my soul cannot resist a feeling of sadness and longing that is not akin to pain and resembles sorrow only as the mist resembles the rain come read to me some poem some simple heartfelt lay that shall soothe this restless feeling and banish the thoughts of day not from the grand old masters not from the bards sublime whose distant footsteps echo through the corridors of time for like strains of martial music their mighty thought suggests life's endless toil and endeavor and to-night i long for rest read from some humbler poet whose songs gush from his heart as showers from the clouds of summer or tears from the eyelids start who through long days of labor and nights devoid of ease still heard in his soul the music of wonderful melodies such songs have power to quiet the restless pulse of care and come like the benediction that follows after prayer then read from some treasured volume a poem of thy choice and lend to the rhyme of the poet the beauty of thy voice and the night shall be filled with music and the cares that infest the day shall fold their tents like arabs and as silently steal away with no great range of imagination these lines have been justly admired for their delicacy of expression some of the images are very effective nothing can be better than the bard sublime whose distant footsteps echo down the corridors of time the idea of the last quatrain is also very effective the poem on the whole however is chiefly to be admired for the graceful insouciance of its meter so well in accordance with the character of the sentiments and especially for the ease of the general manner this ease or naturalness in literary style has long been the fashion to regard as ease in appearance alone as a point of really difficult attainment but not so a natural manner is difficult only to him who should never meddle with it to the unnatural it is but the result of writing with the understanding or with the instinct that the tone in composition should always be that which the mass of mankind would adopt and most perpetually vary of course with the occasion the author who after the fashion of the north american review should be upon all occasions merely quiet must necessarily upon many occasions be simply silly or stupid and has no more right to be considered easy or natural than a cockney exquisite or than the sleeping beauty in the waxworks among the minor poems of bryant none has so much impressed me as one which he entitles june i quote only a portion of it there through the long long summer hours the golden light should lie and thick young herbs and groups of flowers stand in their beauty by the oriole should build and tell his love tale closely beside my cell the idle butterfly should rest him there and there be heard the housewife bee and humming bird 
and what if cheerful shouts at noon come from the village scent or songs of maids beneath the moon with fairy laughter blent and what if in the evening light betrothed lovers walk in sight of my low monument i would the lovely scene around might know no sadder sight or sound i know i know i should not see the season's glorious show nor would its brightness shine for me nor its wild music flow but if around my place of sleep the friends i love should come to weep they might not haste to go soft airs and song and the light and bloom should keep them lingering by my tomb these to their softened hearts should bear the thoughts of what has been and speak of one who cannot share the gladness of the scene whose part in all the pomp that fills the circuit of the summer hills is that his grave is green and deeply would their hearts rejoice to hear again his living voice the rhythmical flow here is even voluptuous nothing could be more melodious the poem has always affected me in a remarkable manner the intense melancholy which seems to well up perforce to the surface of all the poet's cheerful sayings about his grave we find thrillingness to the soul while there is the truest poetic elevation in the thrill the impression left is one of a pleasurable sadness and if in the remaining compositions which i shall introduce to you there be more or less of a similar tone always apparent let me remind you that how or why we know not this certain taint of sadness is inseparably connected with all the higher manifestations of true beauty it is nevertheless a feeling of sadness and longing that is not akin to pain and resembles sorrow only as the mist resembles the rain the taint of which i speak is clearly perceptible even in a poem so full of brilliancy and spirit as the health of edward Coate pinckney i fill this cup to one made up of loveliness alone a woman of her gentle sex the seeming paragon to whom the better elements and kindly stars have given a form so fair that like the air tis less of earth than of heaven her every tone is music's own like those of morning birds and something more than melody dwells ever in her words the coinage of her heart are they and from her lips each flows as one may see the burden be forth issue from the rose affections are as thoughts to her the measure of her hours her feelings have the flagrancy the freshness of young flowers and lovely passions changing off so fill her she appears the image of themselves by turns the idol of past years of her bright face on glance will trace a picture on the brain and of her voice in echoing hearts a sound must long remain but memory such as mine of her so very much endears when death is nigh my latest sigh will not be life's but hers i filled this cup to one made up of loveliness alone a woman of her gentle sex the seeming paragon her health and would on earth there stood some more of such a frame that life might be all poetry and weariness a name it was the misfortune of mr pinckney to have been born too far south had he been a new englander it is probable that he would have been ranked as the first of american lyricists by that magnanimous cabal which has so long controlled the destinies of american letters in conducting the thing called the north american review the poem just cited is especially beautiful but the poetic elevation which it induces we must refer chiefly to our sympathy in the poet's enthusiasm we pardon his hyperboles for the evident earnestness with which they are uttered it was by no means my design however to expatiate upon the merits of what i should read you these will necessarily speak for themselves boccalini in his advertisements from parnassus tells us that zoilus once presented apollo a very caustic criticism upon a very admirable book 
whereupon the god asked him for the beauties of the work he replied that he only busied himself about the errors on hearing this apollo handing him a sack of unwinnowed wheat bade him pick out all the chaff for his reward now this fable answers very well as a hit at the critics but i am by no means sure that the god was in the right i am by no means certain that the true limits of the critical duty are not grossly misunderstood excellence in a poem especially may be considered in the light of an axiom which need only be properly put to become self-evident it is not excellence if it require to be demonstrated as such and thus to point out too particularly the merits of a work of art is to admit that they are not merits altogether among the melodies of thomas moore is one whose distinguished character as a poem proper seems to have been singularly left out of view i allude to his lines beginning come rest in this bosom the intense energy of their expression is not surpassed by anything in byron there are two of the lines in which a sentiment is conveyed that embodies the all in all of the divine passion of love a sentiment which perhaps has found its echo in more and in more passionate human hearts than in any other single sentiment ever embodied in words come rest in this bosom my own stricken dear though the herd have fled from thee thy home is still here here still in the smile that no cloud can o'ercast and a heart and a hand all thy own to the last oh what was love made for if tis not the same through joy and through torment through glory and shame i know not i ask not if guilt's in the heart i but know that i love thee whatever thou art thou hast called me thy angel in moments of bliss and thy angel i'll be mid the horrors of this through the furnace unshrinking thy steps to pursue and shield thee and save thee or perish there too it has been the fashion of late to deny moore imagination while granting him fancy a distinction originating with coleridge than whom no man more fully comprehended the great powers of moore the fact is that the fancy of this poet is so far predominates over all his other faculties and over the fancy of all other men as to have induced very naturally the idea that he is fanciful only but never was there a greater mistake never was a grosser wrong done to the fame of a true poet in the compass of the english language i can call to mind no poem more profoundly more weirdly imaginative in the best sense than the lines commencing i would i were by that dim lake which are the composition of thomas moore i regret that i am unable to remember them one of the noblest and speaking of fancy one of the most singularly fanciful of modern poets was thomas hood his fair inez had always for me an inexpressible charm o oh, saw ye not fair inez she's gone into the west to dazzle when the sun is down and rob the world of rest she took our daylight with her the smiles that we love best with morning blushes on her cheek and pearls upon her breast o oh, turn again fair inez before the fall of night for fear the moon should shine alone and stars unrivalled bright and blessed will the lover be that walks beneath their light and breathes the love against thy cheek i dare not even write would i had been fair inez that gallant cavalier who rode so gaily by thy side and whispered thee so near were there no bonny dames at home or no true lovers here that he should cross the seas to win the dearest of the dear i saw thee lovely inez descend along the shore with bands of noble gentlemen and banners waved before and gentle youth and maidens gay and snowy plumes they wore it would have been a beauteous dream if it had been no more alas alas fair inez she went away with song with music waiting on her steps and shooting of the throng but some were sad and felt no mirth 
but only music's wrong in sounds that sang farewell farewell to her you've loved so long farewell farewell fair ines that vessel never bore so fair a lady on its deck nor danced so light before alas for pleasure on the sea and sorrow on the shore the smile that blessed one lover's heart has broken many more the haunted house by the same author is one of the truest poems ever written one of the truest one of the most unexceptionable one of the most thoroughly artistic both in its theme and in its execution it is moreover powerfully ideal imaginative i regret that its length renders it unsuitable for the purposes of this lecture in place of it permit me to offer the universally appreciated bridge of sighs one more unfortunate weary of breath rashly importunate gone to her death take her up tenderly lift her with care fashioned so slenderly young and so fair look at her garments clinging like cerements whilst the wave constantly drips from her clothing take her up instantly loving but not loathing touch her not scornfully think of her mournfully gently and humanly not in the stains of her all that remains of her now is pure womanly make no deep scrutiny into her mutiny rash and undutiful past all dishonor death has left on her only the beautiful where the lamps quiver so far in the river with many a light from window and casement from garret to basement she stood with amazement houseless by night the bleak wind of march made her tremble and shiver but not the dark arch or the black flowing river mad from life's history glad to death's mystery swift to be hurled anywhere anywhere out of the world in she plunged boldly no matter how coldly the rough river ran over the brink of it picture it think of it dissolute man live in it drink of it then if you can still for all slips of hers one of eve's family wipe those poor lips of hers oozing so clamily loop up her tresses escaped from the comb her fair auburn tresses whilst wonderment guesses where was her home who was her father who was her mother had she a sister had she a brother or was there a dearer one still a nearer one yet than all the other alas for the rarity of christian charity under the sun oh it was pitiful near the whole city full home she had come sisterly brotherly fatherly motherly feeling had changed love by harsh evidence thrown from its eminence even god's providence seemed estranged take her up tenderly lift her with care fashioned so slenderly young and so fair ere her limbs frigidly stiffen too rigidly decently kindly smooth and compose them and her eyes close them staring so blindly dreadfully staring through muddy impurity as when the daring last look of despairing fixed on futurity perishing gloomily spurred by contumely cold in humanity burning insanity into her rest cross her hands humbly as if praying dumbly over her breast owing her weakness her evil behavior and leaving with meekness her sins to her savior the vigor of this poem is no less remarkable than its pathos the versification although carrying the fanciful to the very verge of the fantastic is nevertheless admirably adapted to the wild insanity which is the thesis of the poem among the minor poems of lord byron is one which has never received from the critics the praise which it undoubtedly deserves though the day of my destiny is over and the star of my fate hath declined thy soft heart refused to discover the faults which so many could find though my soul with my grief was acquainted it shrunk not to share it with me and the love which my spirit hath painted it never hath found but in thee then when nature around me is smiling the last smile which answers to mine i do not believe it beguiling because it 
reminds me of thine, and when winds are at war with the ocean, as the breasts I believed in with me, if their billows excite an emotion, it is that they bear me from thee. Though the rock of my last hope is shivered, and its fragments are sunk in the wave, though I feel that my soul is delivered to pain it shall not be its slave. There is many a pang to pursue me. They may crush, but they shall not contemn. They may torture, but they shall not subdue me. Tis of thee that I think, not of them. Though human, thou didst not deceive me. Though woman, thou didst not forsake. Though love, thou forbearest to grieve me. Though slander, thou never couldst shake. Though trusted, thou didst not disclaim me. Though parted, it was not to fly. Though watchful, twas not to defame me. Nor mute, that the world might be lie. Yet I blame not the world, nor despise it nor the war of the many with one. If my soul was not fitted to prize it, t'was folly not sooner to shun. And if dearly that error hath cost me, and more than I once could foresee, I have found that whatever is lost me, I could not deprive me of thee. From the wreck of the past which hath perished, thus much I at least may recall, it hath taught me that which I most cherished deserved to be dearest of all. In the desert a fountain is springing, in the wide waste there still is a tree, and a bird in the solitude singing which speaks to my spirit of thee. Although the rhythm here is one of the most difficult, and the versification could scarcely be improved, no nobler theme ever engaged the pen of a poet. It is a soul-elevating idea that no man can consider himself entitled to complain of fate while in his adversity he still retains the unwavering love of a woman. From Alfred Lord Tennyson, although in perfect sincerity I regard him as the noblest poet that ever lived, I have left myself time to cite only a very brief specimen. I call him, and think him, the noblest of poets, not because of the impressions he produces are at all times the most profound, not because the poetical excitement which he induces is at all times the most intense, but because it is at all times the most ethereal, in other words, the most elevating and most pure. No poet is so little of the earth earthy. What I am about to read is from his last long poem, The Princess. Tears, idle tears, I know not what they mean. Tears from the depth of some divine despair rise in the heart and gather to the eyes. In looking on the happy autumn fields and thinking of the days that are no more. Fresh as the first beam glittering on a sail that brings our friends up from the underworld, sad as the last which reddens over me that sinks with all we love below the verge, so sad, so fresh. The days that are no more. Ah, sad and strange, as in the dark summer dawns, The earliest pipe of half-wakened birds, The dying ears, when unto dying eyes The casement slowly grows a glimmering square, So sad, so strange, the days that are no more. Dear as remembered kisses after death, And sweet as those by hopeless fancy feigned, on lips that are for others, deep as love, deep as first love, and wild with all regret, O oh, death in life, the days that are no more. Thus, although in a very cursory and imperfect manner, I have endeavored to convey to you my conception of the poetic principle. It has been my purpose to suggest that while this principle itself is strictly and simply the human aspiration for supernal beauty, the manifestation of the principle is always found in an elevating excitement of the soul, quite independent of that passion which is the intoxication of the heart, or that truth which is the satisfaction of the reason. 
for in regard to passion alas its tendency is to degrade rather than to elevate the soul love on the contrary love the true divine eros the uranian as distinguished from the dionan and venus is unquestionably the purest and truest of all poetical themes and in regard to truth if to be sure through the attainment of a truth we are led to perceive harmony where none was apparent before we experience at once the true poetical effect but this effect is referable to the harmony alone and not in the least degree to the truth which merely served to render the harmony manifest we shall reach however more immediately a distinct conception of what the true poetry is by mere reference to a few of the simple elements which induce in the poet himself the poetical effect he recognizes the ambrosia which nourishes his soul in the bright orbs that shine in the heaven in the volutes of the flower in the clustering of low shrubberies in the waving of the grain fields in the slanting of tall eastern trees in the blue distance of mountains in the grouping of clouds in the twinkling of half-hidden brooks in the gleaming of silver rivers in the repose of sequestered lakes in the star mirroring depths of lonely wells he perceives it in the songs of birds in the harp of bullace in the sighing of the night wind in the repining voice of the forest in the surf that complains to the shore in the fresh breath of the woods in the scent of the violet in the voluptuous perfume of the hyacinth in the suggestive odor that comes to him at eventide from far distant undiscovered islands over dim oceans illimitable and unexplored he owns it in all noble thoughts in all unworldly motives in all holy impulses in all chivalrous generous and self-sacrificing deeds he feels it in the beauty of a woman in the grace of her step in the luster of her eye in the melody of her voice in her soft laughter in her sigh in the harmony of the rustling of her robes he deeply feels in her winning endearments in her burning enthusiasms in her gentle charities in her meek and devotional endurances but above all ah far above all he kneels to it he worships it in the faith in the purity in the strength in the altogether divine majesty of her love let me conclude by the recitation of yet another brief poem one very different in character from any that I have before quoted. It is by Motherwell, and is called The Song of the Cavalier. With our modern and altogether rational ideas of the absurdity and impiety of warfare, we are not precisely in that frame of mind best adapted to sympathize with the sentiments and thus to appreciate the real excellence of the poem. To do this fully, we must identify ourselves in fancy with the soul of the old cavalier. Then mount, then mount, brave gallants all, and don your helms amain. Death's couriers, fame and honor call. No shrewish tear shall fill your eye when the sword hilts in your hand. Heart whole will part and no whit sigh for the fairest of the land let piping swain and craven white thus weep the pulling cry our business is like men to fight end of section eleven